Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are wrapping up our section on endocrine physiology. This is recording part 7. We're going to talk briefly about fetal physiology. The fetus can survive for up to 10 minutes with total oxygen deprivation. Interruption to oxygen supply could occur from umbilical cord compression or prolapse of the cord through the birth canal placental abruption, which is separation of the placenta from the uterine wall, and of course maternal hypoxemia or hypotension. In response, there will be redistribution of blood to the fetal brain, heart, placenta, and adrenal glands, decreased oxygen consumption, and anaerobic metabolism. Now the normal fetal PO2 is only 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury but fetal hemoglobin is slightly different than adult hemoglobin, and it is shifted to the left. Also, we know that maternal hemoglobin is shifted to the right, and this makes fetal hemoglobin have a much greater affinity for oxygen than maternal hemoglobin. So the system is designed to facilitate transfer of oxygen from the mother to the fetus. Also, normal fetal hemoglobin is about 15 grams per deciliter compared with only 12 grams per deciliter in the mother. All inhalational anesthetic agents and most IV agents and opioids cross the placenta freely. Therefore, if general anesthesia is performed, the fetus will be anesthetized. And if this occurs during a cesarean section, we expect the fetus will be born with anesthesia in its system. Local anesthetics, if they are uncharged, can cross the placenta. As you know, this will depend on pKa as well as maternal pH. And once again, the phenomenon of ion trapping can occur because the fetus is more acidotic than the mother. Local anesthetics may cross the placenta, become ionized, and be unable to cross back to the mother. In the fetal circulation, well oxygenated blood from the placenta with a saturation of about 80% comes through the umbilical vein and mixes with blood in the fetal inferior vena cava, which has a saturation of about 25%. From there, it goes to the right atrium. In this diagram, we see the oxygenated blood coming from the umbilical vein, mixing with blood in the inferior vena cava and going to the fetal right atrium. From here, instead of following the normal path to the right ventricle and to the lungs, the blood is preferentially directed through the foramen ovale, the hole between the right and left atria. It then goes into the left atrium, the left ventricle, and then out the aorta to the brain and the heart. We don't really want blood going through the right ventricle into the lungs because the lungs don't participate in gas exchange when the fetus, before the fetus is born. Poorly oxygenated blood from the superior vena cava also goes to the right atrium. And due to flow characteristics, this blood tends to go down to the right ventricle, and that's the blood that goes to the pulmonary artery. Either way, since the lungs aren't inflated, pulmonary vascular resistance is very high, and any blood that does go into the pulmonary vasculature gets shunted across the ductus arteriosus and into the descending aorta and back to the placenta. So we see a parallel circulation where the right ventricle ejects about two-thirds of the blood and the left ventricle ejects about one-third of the blood, but as much of it as possible bypasses the lungs and goes back to the aorta and down to the umbilical arteries, which can go back to the placenta for oxygenation. When a baby is born, placental blood flow decreases, systemic vascular resistance increases, and left atrial and left ventricular pressures go up. Pulmonary vascular resistance drops significantly once the lungs expand. This increases pulmonary blood flow and decreases right atrial and right ventricular pressures. 
So left atrial pressure exceeds right atrial pressure, and at this point, the patent foramen of valley closes. About 25% of adults still do have what's called a probe patent foramen of valley, which means if you dissected that heart, you would be able to stick a metal probe through that hole. If that's the case, then air bubbles or clots could also sneak their way through that hole anytime that right atrial pressure exceeds left atrial pressure, which is not the normal physiologic state. This would be a paradoxical embolus where uh, an air bubble or a clot in the right side of the circulation crosses to the left side, the arterial side, and goes to the brain in the arterial system. As SVR increases in, and pulmonary vascular resistance decreases, blood starts to flow backwards from the aorta through the arteri ductus arteriosus and back into the pulmonary artery. Then the wall of the ductus closes and constricts. This happens because of increased oxygenation in the ductus due to the functioning of the lungs as well as loss of the prostaglandin release that keeps this open. If the ductus doesn't close, we have a PDA, a patent ductus arteriosus, which allows oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to mix together. This can be treated medically with indomethacin, which blocks prostaglandin synthesis, or it can be ligated and closed surgically. That's it for this recording. Please let me know, as always, if you have any questions about the material.